All right, guys. Thanks again for uh, being here today. Uh, Matt uh, mentioned before, my name's Joe. Uh, going to be going over a lot of the uh, the arc filtering uh, <clears throat> um, arc filtering settings that uh, are available on any of the toolpaths in Mastercam. Um, so essentially, what I'm going to be doing today is going over exactly what it is. Um, you know, what does it do for my toolpath performance? How can it affect surface finish? Um, and then kind of go into a little bit about uh, you know whether you actually need this function for your actual machine's capabilities. Um, and then another big question that we see all the time on the uh, the tech support side as well is the difference between smoothing and arc filtering. So we're going to be going over some of that as well today. Uh, so just kind of getting ready for this here, I have uh, I've actually had uh, got a few toolpath groups set up here, um, and it's just a contour off of a spline right now. Um, and then we can actually look at a little bit about, uh, you know, what what arc filtering is going to be doing to that file size, what it's going to be doing to, uh, you know, uh, just the geometry that's going to be outputting here. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm going to go over. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I'm going to be going over uh, just the uh, kind of the geometry that uh, gets output output uh, with arc filter completely off. Um, so if I back plot this here, um, I can show you guys um, a little bit about some of the uh, the segments that show up in this uh, this toolpath here, and that's going to ultimately affect your surface finish in the long run. So if we zoom in here a little bit, we see all these uh, these white dots here that display on the toolpath. Um, that's this option here uh, that says display endpoints. What that's essentially doing it's it's uh, displaying different lines of code uh, that's going to be posting out. Um, with this, with this, with this uh, feature off, um, and we'll we'll kind of look at a little bit about uh, how it uh, how it changes here. So um, I've actually got uh, the geometry from this uh, this back plot here. Uh, I've got it uh, on the screen. Uh, so what I can do is actually um, uh, turn this on, and then we can see exactly how many line segments that uh, that geometry posted out. Uh, in accordance to uh, the, those settings that we selected. So if we just say statistics here, we see that that, that back plot uh, produced 412 lines. So uh, that's completely with that, uh, with that arc filter setting off. So looking forward here, um, we see uh, just the default values that the arc filtering page uh, displays here. Um, and this is what you're going to be looking at when you first get into um, uh, you know, get into some of these settings here. Um, when this is turned on, we'll actually check this box here, and then we'll be able to slide this this bar here back and forth to uh, kind of set your settings for um, whether you want your cut tolerance to be in accordance to your line arc tolerance. So right now, I'm just uh, displaying it at its normal uh, default values that comes in. Uh, right now we're at 95 and 5. Uh, we're going to look into a couple other operations that uh, you know have some different values here, um, and then we're going to see how that uh, alters that here. A um, little bit before we get into that too, I want to go over uh, some of these settings in here. Uh, we can actually create arcs in the three separate planes uh, in G17, G18, and G19 as well. Uh, kind of just depends on which plane that you're going to be ultimately working in, uh, which ones that we want to actually um, convert. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit later as well. Um, for now, I'll just say OK, and uh, we can see what we uh, output here. So right now, we're at pretty much the uh, default settings here, like we said. Um, so we're seeing a very similar output to with the filter completely being off. Um, what this is essentially saying is if we go back here, it's saying that any arc that's greater than this, this tolerance here, it's going to say, or any geometry that's greater than that, uh, that tolerance there, it's going to say that that would be a line. So now, uh, kind of looking at uh, some of these adjusted values here, um, we can get into this and we'll say uh, back plotting this at uh, this value here. So we're at 40% and 60% rather than the 95 and 5. So we see a lot more a lot more spread out toolpathing here. So we've got our uh, we've got our lines a lot more separated uh, away from each other, uh, unlike uh, what we were saying before. 
Um, and I actually have that uh, geometry uh, displayed as well on the screen. So we can similarly go that route. Um, I'm going to say home and I'll say statistics about what's on my screen. And right now we're not producing almost any lines. So I, I believe the lines that we're seeing are just going to be that wrap it out. But in terms of the actual toolpath, we're just getting solely arcs, which is what we want um, in terms of a, uh, a surface finish standpoint. So we're getting closer to uh, that, uh, you know, uh, optimal value that we really want to reach. Um, and this is obviously a very simple example. We're going to be getting into a little bit more uh, complex here um, in the next coming minutes here, but uh, we should be uh, we should be on the right track. So. Uh, looking at uh, this last example for this tolerance group, um, we see that we're at 5 and 95, which is essentially maxed out towards the uh, the line arc tolerance side side of things. Um, so if we say OK, we can uh, you know see the output as well. Um, I also have that level on. So we can back plot this operation here, and we see that we're, we're getting essentially some of the same outputs here, but we're, uh, we're definitely in the right uh, direction in terms of file size as well. Uh, we see the original toolpath that we had was right around 40 kilobytes. Um, this is the exact same toolpath with just this setting on, and we see it uh, reduced by almost 75% here. So, um, so right now, we've, we've just been working in an overall tolerance of 1,000th. This is going to be where you set this in here as well, in this little box up here. Um, as you see here, I have different toolpath groups, um, and we can see how that um, that affects your file size with just um, actually going through and changing that value. Um, so right now I have 3,000. Uh, I set that as my total tolerance for each of these operations. And essentially, I'm doing the exact same thing, going through um, you know the different default settings um, and then kind of going, go ahead and um, adjusting those values to, you know, see what we'd like here. So we saw beforehand that our first operation with the filter off was 40, around 40 kilobytes. And with that, with that overall tolerance up to 3000s, we're at 27, which is being the same exact toolpath. So we can kind of see what the output uh, differs. If we say this and this, I'm going to backplot both of these functions. And we should be able to see the difference in geometry as it goes around here. So I'm going to slow this down just a bit. And now essentially what that's doing is it's showing the difference between um, how spread out these lines are going to be. So once we get into um, a little bit more of the, uh, the, the adjusted values, uh, we can uh, definitely see a lot of a... Um, a difference there. Um, so right now I'm going to say the uh, the 40 and 60, which is when we first started seeing that real big jump in uh, file size reduction and um, uh, in terms of geometry being uh, kind of smashed down here. Uh, so we can backplot this. I'm actually going to step through this. So we see this is our operation, our first operation here, this uh, contour with the 1000 tolerance. And then going through here, we have a lot more spread out of lines because of that tolerance being up here. Now, um, similarly, we'll see something uh, fairly uh, in accordance with, uh, you know, pushing that to overall tolerance down as well. Um, we saw the, uh, the file size get smaller as we went up. We should see it go up as the tolerance gets lower. So right now we see the same operation. Now we're at 107 kilobytes. So quite a quite a significant uh, change up here. Um, we can actually backplot that and see just a little bit about the endpoints here. And now they're extremely uh, close together, we can see, with that display endpoints on. So I'll just go back to here. Um, as we get down here, um, we're going to obviously be we following suit with the other toolpath groups that we've covered already. Um, 
So at this point, we can um, just kind of go over a little bit more about these settings here. Um, in the in this box here, we, we already went over that we can create plant or create arcs in G17, G18, and G19 as well. Um, we can also specify minimum and maximum arc radii that we'd like to use. Um, right now, the default values are just set to um, five thousandths, and then the maximum is at a hundred inches at this point. Um, that essentially just covering your ground. You can uh, kind of uh, adjust that as needed. Um, and the, uh, the total tolerance should actually just be, um, it cannot be less than um, obviously the total tolerance that we're going to be uh, tool pathing off of here. So a so, uh, fairly uh, simple example here, guys. Um, we can uh, get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty here um, with another one here. So I'm just going to switch gears um, and I will actually pull up this example that we were going to go over. And right now we see uh, a, a pretty fairly simple mold uh, that we're going to be, um, you know, getting some of these arc filtering uh, values explained with. So I can uh, actually expand a lot of these here. And I'm just going to go through each of these tool paths and uh, a little bit with some of the settings that are available to you with the arc filter page. Um, so just going through here, uh, right now we have the arc filter on at 35% and 65% uh, line arc tolerance. Um, and right now we see a file size of 761 kilobytes, per, uh, give or take. Um, we can back plot that. So similar to how we saw with the, uh, the first example here, we, uh, we had that display endpoints on. And we can see essentially all the little moves that this, this tool pass is going to create. And you see how we're, we're actually just going in line segments with this on here this, in this direction. So this is with arc filter on 35% and 65. Um, right now we see that it uh, was at 761 kilobytes. And now we'll show you a little bit about um, with it completely off. And we see that's at 2722 at this point. So even just back plying that, we should see a lot more white in terms of our, our endpoints here. So just going through, we see those, like we said, that those lines are a lot, uh, are a lot more bunched together here. So um, going through some of these settings, um, we can go back into our arc filter tolerance page. Um, right now, um, for this operation here, I'm saying, uh, which this is actually available if you're using arc filtering or smoothing as well. Um, it's this output 3D arc motion. Um, and what this essentially is doing is it's, um, it's as you're in a dynamic tool path when you're spiraling in to, into your part, uh, it's going to actually uh, output that as geo or geo twos and geo threes rather than a, a lot of uh, geo ones. Um, that could be used for uh, newer age controllers that support uh, helical interpolation, things like that. Um, but obviously, it, uh, it kind of depends on what uh, what capabilities that you have in your shop. Um, so that's uh, one pretty useful uh, little setting that we have available to us. Um, like we were saying before on that previous example, um, I actually selected my minimum arc radius as to be 1,000, just as we uh, have in our total tolerance here, and a maximum arc radius of 2,000. So. We can see what that does to our uh, our total toolpath here, toolpath size. Uh, that's essentially with that uh, that 35 and 30 or 65 uh, filter uh, settings. So now we can see we're adding a sizable amount of uh, of toolpath here. Um, we can actually uh, backplot this guy. I'm going to. And then essentially what that's doing is limiting um, what that arc uh, could be, obviously. Um, beforehand, the default values were at 5,000s and 100. So bumping that down to 2, um, that could obviously, you know, um, increase your surface finish here. Um, in terms of the uh, couple other settings that we have available to us, um, right now I, I selected uh, the Titan arc filtering set, uh, tolerance. And what that's essentially doing is it's taking what I have in my cut tolerance here um, 
and it's saying, or no, it's taking this, this arc filter tolerance. I apologize. Um, and it's saying I want five percent of that to tight or to tighten it to five percent of that. So we can use that obviously to um, it's going to uh, increase our file size a bit here, um, and then uh, essentially just uh, like we said, driving towards that uh, that superior surface finish that we're trying to get. Um, we're available to do the same thing with uh, lines as well. Um, what that's doing is taking that as well, saying I want 5% of that, and then upping that. It's going to result in an up uh, a larger file size here. So um, like we said, we already went over the arc filter being off. Um, so now I kind of want to go over a little bit more of the, uh, the smoothing and how that uh, affects your toolpath in here. Uh, in you know comparison to uh, to what we just went over with uh, arc filtering, so just going on through uh, uh, the examples here, um, we, I'm going to actually expand all these. Um, and what I'm going to do is actually show you uh, at the same values at 50% and 50% uh, the difference between what smoothing looks like and what arc filtering looks like, and what it's going to result with. Um, so I'm, I made actually a view sheet here so I can, uh, you know, kind of get into the nitty gritty here. Um, we see that with smoothing on that uh, this file size went up uh, exponentially here um, in comparison with the arc filtering being on at 50 percent. We're at around 805 uh, kilobytes here. So the main the main uh, kind of graphical representation I wanted to show you guys um, is we can see in the first operation that we have a lot more of a smooth um, kind of helix uh, geometry that we're seeing here. Um, that's essentially because uh, smoothing is taking um, it's taking splines and uh, essentially weighing the points density on where it needs to be in the actual toolpath. So it's going to uh, obviously result in a larger toolpath size here. Um, we can back plot that out essentially. And um, kind of going through here, we should see a lot of uh, different points um, associated with this uh, rather than what we saw with um, our arc filter, which if we follow suit here, um, we'll just back plot it quick. And we see we see a lot more spread out points, and uh, those look look like definite uh, geo ones in this situation as well. So, um, just going through a little bit more of the smoothing parameters here, um, we can say shift points randomly along the toolpath, and uh, essentially what that's doing is it's it's trying to uh, create a uniform point distribution uh, throughout those splines. Um, so obviously we see here uh, we actually went down in file size uh, because it's it was able to you know read that interpolation here. Um, so from the 35 or 3585 here to uh, 3376, uh, you know, just kind of chipping away at that at file size uh, while obviously trying to uh, maintain that surface quality here. Um, another option that we have available to us um, in uh, in our smoothing parameters here um, is this uh, fixed segment length. And what we can actually say is we don't want any segment at all in our, in our smoothing, um, once we apply the smoothing uh, settings here, uh, to be larger than uh, five thousandths. So obviously we see what that does to our file size um, and we see what that can uh, show in our back plot window as well with our points being on. So obviously, uh, we see a lot of uh, little small moves here. Um, and this would be uh, kind of, a, not essential, but um, it would be uh, more suitable for, uh, you know, some of those controllers that do have those, uh, those advanced uh, look ahead capabilities. Um, so if your machine has those, uh, you know, that, that potential to actually do so, um, it's always a, uh, an option in Mastercam as well. So uh, just going through this here, um, I wanted to show you a little bit more about uh, some of the NC code that uh, gets posted out as well. Um, 
So trying to sort through all these uh, these dynamic toolpaths, uh, we'll actually um, we'll go back to our first example quick, um, and I actually have those posted out currently, um, so we can see uh, a little bit about the uh, the comparison in between the two um, two uh, settings here. So right now, um, this is uh, an option in Simcoe uh, Professional that, like Matt said. Um, so we're going to be going through uh, a little bit of the comparison between these two files. And up here, we can see that we're comparing the default arc filter with the default settings uh, compared to um, with it being completely off on the right side over here. So just going through here, we see uh, fairly similar code like we saw in the back plot window as well. Um, obviously, uh, going to be filter is going to be starting to filter out some of those um, those arcs here. So those red lines are just uh, differences in what we see in the uh, the toolpath here. So I wanted to look at uh, comparing the 4060 to the 595 as well. And it looks like I just closed it out. I apologize. <laughs> um, do this. I apologize. Um, and then 595 here. Perfect. Um, so what we can actually go through is we see all these G2s here. Um, in comparison to uh, what we saw in the first guy here. And we're starting at G1s and obviously just feeding through there. Um, these are all arc movements. Um, we see uh, in the 595, uh, the 5% versus 95% arc line tolerance, uh, we're still able to cut out a, a, a solid amount of, uh, of code as well um, with it being able to interpolate that. So um, we see, like we saw in the back plot, um, we're able to see in our, our levels here in our geometry, we saw essentially all arc entities rather than, um, you know, those G1s that are going to be um, defaulted to post out here. So um, it looks like, um, what else can we go over here? So uh, in terms of our 3D modeling, um, a general rule of thumb uh, to select that total tolerance um, that we selected here. Um, we want that to be around three times uh, what our step over is going to essentially be. So if we're stepping over a, uh, one thousandth on a uh, on a finishing job, um, we want that total total tolerance to kind of uh, be in accordance with that, and then we can adjust our line filtering or arc filtering settings uh, accordingly there. So. Um, I believe uh, that's all that I have for you guys today. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Ryan right now, and he's going to talk to you guys about uh, a little bit of the options with uh, horizontal machining. Thank you guys for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. So we did have one question in there. Would this file size reduction work for raster? And basically the short answer is yes. The arc filter will, will work, and that page will look very similar to really any 2D or 3D toolpath in MasterCam. You just have to be mindful of when you're doing a finishing toolpath, you know, what, what the surface finish of the part needs to be. And this is where a bit, it kind of comes into play where it depends on your tooling machine controller setup. Because say, say you got a older Fidal and it doesn't have any look ahead at all, you know, a adding filtering to a finish pass is probably going to help because instead of all the little linear points, you're, you're going to get arcs so that the tool path will end up being smoother. And then you could turn on those smoothing settings and shift the points randomly because some of you that get into 3D surfacing, you might see where the part feels smooth, but it can look faceted, you know, if you shine a light on it or how, how you hold it up to the light in the shop. And that faceting look is basically a, I'm trying to think of the right word, just a transposition of how the math of the endpoints of the G code are working out. So when you add that smoothing in, you, you won't get that, you know, strict faceted sort of look, even though it feels smooth. And, you know, if you run like a gauge on it or similar, it'll, it'll feel smooth. So it's really just finding out what, what those settings are going to work best in your application. 
And what I've always been told is if you're on a finishing tool path is you want the slider in basically the opposite direction of kind of what Joe was talking about. So you want a higher cut tolerance, meaning that the tool is going to follow closer to the geometry versus being able to give it room to create arcs. So, you know, a 90-10 is a good starting point. So you want 90 to the cut tolerance side and 10 to the line arc side where, you know, it's not going to shorten up the code a whole lot, but depending on the shape and geometry of the part, you, you could still get a good um, amount of, you know, cleaning up that code and adding arcs in there versus strictly linear points because that kind of gets back to the, the core of a cam system where to be as accurate as possible, it's going to output linear moves because that's the best way for the, you know, essentially the trigonometry or the geometry of the math to follow that surface as close as it can, kind of depending on what your, what your total tolerance is. And we have one other question. When using the area mill, my file size is huge compared to using area roughing. But when I try to adjust arc filtering, I get a warning in the box of area mill. How can I reduce the area mill file size? Honestly, we haven't been using area mill a lot since OptiRough came out. Um, think of OptiRough as a new and improved version of area mill. So, you know, we could we could look at your file specifically on seeing how we could how we could shorten that up. But there's there's kind of very few use cases I've seen where area mill can provide a better tool path result than dynamic rough will. The uh, the area mill is mostly going to be line segments anyways. It's more going to be a traditional pocket style yeah. routine, but in the new multi-core processing and such, mostly used with high-speed cutters, things like that. Uh, but again, we can certainly uh, take a look at that file and uh, see if we can do anything else to it. Yeah, so what Ryan was kind of getting at there is area mill is what we can what we would consider a traditional, you know, offset style tool path where you take, you know, the simplest, simplest example, you know, you take a box, the tool path is going to offset itself based on the geometry to achieve the step over that, that you put in. Whereas something like dynamic mill or OptiRough is that's a chip load based tool path. So it's not, it's looking at the geometry to, to determine the extents of the tool path. But as far as each individual cut, it's analyzing what you put in as the chip load in your tool settings page and maintaining that chip load throughout the entire cut. So that's kind of the basics of it. But let me pause here for a sec, unless there's any more questions on filtering or if you guys think of it as we go through here, you know, feel free to put them in the box and we'll, we'll get to them at the end of the webinar here. But let me transfer it over to Ryan and hang on one second. Thanks, Matt. My name is Ryan Rommel here. I probably spoke to a lot of you or have been in contact with you uh, one time or another. But I just wanted to go over some of the HMC or the Horizontal Machining Center examples and programming them in Mastercam using a couple different methods and techniques in order to make your lives a little bit easier and to shorten up your programming time, hopefully. So to get started, I have a single part here mounted on my fixture. I've applied a couple different tool paths to my front face, my right side, back and my left. If we go to our planes manager, you're going to notice that my WCS is always going to be set to top. That's going to be your world coordinate system and that always needs to be set to my top plane. The reason being is because when the post goes to process the code, it's going to see the change of the planes from my front to my right, to my left, to my back, and it's going to use my top WCS in order to calculate out the rotational angle. So again, that's going to be a very uh, important step here is to keep that top WCS. And then without here, you can see that my plane nomen is now changing from a front plane to a right side plane to a left plane or even a backside plane. And those are just different ones that I'm using. Again, we can see that inside of my tool pass here in my tool pass manager. If I wanted to take that, we could also back plot some of those features. Step those forward and see 
a couple of the options here from my front side, my right side, my back. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating two-dimensional and three-dimensional tool paths on these different planes. The way I can create those planes is either by going to the planes manager and using some of the default ones. I can also hit the little plus sign up next to planes and go off of geometry or solid face. You could also right click on your top plane and say create a plane relative to it and then create your front, your back, your right and your left planes. And this is gonna create a copy off my top and then create our, our corresponding planes around my part. The other alternative technique to that too is by using your single work offset here, that would allow me to set my planes once on my machine to be center of rotation and I picked it up to be the center of my block here. Okay, so everything is spawning off the, uh, off the center point of this block. That would allow me to set the one plane and anywhere I go around my part, it's going to be referencing the one work offset or the one plane that I initially set. Now obviously once you find your center of rotation, you can write those numbers down and theoretically those numbers are gonna change unless something catastrophic happens on the machine, which hopefully doesn't happen. The other option that you could do too, if you prefer to pick up each face independently, would be to take those planes and we can actually shift that out to the face and make it true to that face. So you can see from my front plane, I actually just went in there and said edit. You can pick on your Z stem instead of the center of the bore for, uh, for that. You could actually go right out to the front face of that part. And now all your numbers are going to be looking correctly. That's gonna be important because if you are using absolute versus incremental, if you're using center of rotation, your absolute numbers are all coming off of that center of rotation, so you might see some positive values. Your numbers aren't gonna look as clean. However, if you do set up a plane on that front face, that is now considered absolute zero, and so then your values would look good there. Otherwise, if you prefer, you can certainly use incremental, and that typically comes off of where the chain height is being located um, or, or where it's chained from. Okay, and then again with that, I can have my front, my right side, my back and my left. And again, I'm just assigning a new work offset to each of those planes. In this case, I'm doing some extended work offsets. If I wanted to, I could actually take that and put it into a machine simulation. A machine simulation does have a, a few different default machines. You will see a horizontal machine in there as well. If you would like uh, a custom machine simulation, that's something we can certainly talk to you about and tie that in with, uh, with your post-processor even. But if I run this through, you're gonna see that I'm taking my cuts on the different sides of my part here. It'll show the index. I can slow it down a little bit here, I apologize. And again, in this case, I'm just doing two-dimensional contours, facing kind of tool pass. So again, that's gonna be one way on how we could actually set up a part, either working off of center of rotation and keeping my WCS to top and then toggling between my front plane, my right side, back and left, or anything in between. Again, if there is a plane that was at a 45, if there's a, a solid face, you could certainly create a plane off of that solid face, keeping the same origin point. You could also, again, make a duplicate of a plane and then just edit that plane and change that over to a 45 as well. That would be another alternative. So that's gonna be one example here. Another example that I had queued up for you is going to be on a tombstone example. This is gonna be a kind of a high production kind of mode here where obviously I have my tombstone modeled up. I have all my different parts modeled on my vices. 
And what I can do in this case is I created a stock model. The stock model I can use as my verification stock. And a stock model allows you to go in and pick off of specific models. What I did there is I actually have all my raw stock on a particular level that are queued up in the correct locations. And so in my stock model, I can actually just window select everything. And that allows me to go into my verify options and tell it to pull off my stock model. And then I can also put in my tombstone and all my vices for the different sides of my part. Now, it's also a good time to kind of talk about view sheets. I know Joe had a couple view sheets and view sheets are very popular on the horizontal world. You're gonna see that uh, I have a couple of them down here at the bottom. I have one at my front face, my right, my back, my left, and ISO. And you're gonna notice that by clicking on each one of these, it looks like I'm missing a couple parts. Well, what I did here is a view sheet will support a number of different things. One thing is gonna be planes. You can also put in levels. And so you can see from my front view sheet, I'm displaying my tombstone along with my front side parts and vices. If I went to my right side view sheet, you can see that my planes and my levels now change their own to only pulling in my right side. And you can see that my planes are now on my right side as well. So view sheets make it very easy, very quickly to get around to the different parts here versus going in doing a right click, go to front, then having to change your planes around, then having to go to our levels and you know turn these guys on, right? So the view sheets make it very easy to do all of those different, uh, different views. If you needed to create a new view sheet, what you can do is you can actually hit the little plus sign down here and type in what it is, press enter, and that's gonna go ahead and create that view sheet. We now just need to go ahead and tell it what do we all want on the view sheet. You can go to the correct view. You can put in the correct levels and maybe even the correct plane that you're wanting to work on. Do a right click and say save view sheet bookmark. And now anytime you go back to reference it, you're gonna see now it pulls in exactly what I want. This is my front view my final solid model part with only my front tombstone. If I go to that new one I created, now I'm kind of at that skewed view with my raw stock and all of the tombstone and vices on displayed. The other thing I wanna point out is that on this particular part, I just did some standard operations. I did a spot drill and a drill. I did a 2D dynamic with some filtering, as Joe covered before. And then I just did a contour to finish the, the bore there. I only applied that on one particular part. And I did that because we have a option in MasterCam called Toolpath Transform. You'll typically find that up here on the uh, Toolpath page on the right-hand side, Toolpath Transform. And that allows me to go in there and either translate it, mirror it, or rotate the specific tool pass. So what I ended up doing is after creating one particular sets of tool path, I went into the parameters and I can tell it to translate. I wanna translate it by setting up new tool planes and to save those planes. And then I can also assign new work offsets to each of those planes. With that, I can tell it what operations do we all wanna transform. So in this case, I'm transforming all my, my standard operations that I would have here. And then with that, I'm telling it to do it in a rectangular fashion, and I put in my distance. So between part to part, we're looking at six inches. In X, in Y, to get down to the next set of parts, I'm going down negative seven inches and some change. You can see that my instances, we're doing two instances in X and three in Y, and because it pulls in the negative seven, it knows to drop it down. Now by going in and telling it to save the planes, you're gonna notice that if I actually go to my planes manager, we have our first plane that I created the tool pass with. I'm using work offset zero, which is G54. And if I run down through those, 
Now we can see we have a G55, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then also if I would have my other planes on, we could go ahead and see those particular ones as well. Now we get into our extended work offset, so P1, 2, 3, 4, and etc. And that would allow the operator to set up a specific work offset for each particular part and make adjustments accordingly versus trying to make adjustments to the entire fixture and risk running one side out versus the other. That way each part is specific to its own work offset. And again, by doing that, we can set up a couple of our tool paths, go into the transform and let the transform actually do the work for us versus having to go into the planes and create one off of each particular face, set my work off, set my origin, things like that. The other thing that I find is kind of cool is we can actually transform a transform. And what I mean by that is on toolpath number seven, what I'm doing is I'm actually rotating. So I did a, uh, a translate rectangular to fill up a, a particular face. And then with that, I can actually rotate that previous transform around my tombstone being that all sides are gonna be the same part. Again, by doing that, I can tell it to rotate and then I can tell it the number of instances, the angles to start and in between, and then also what plane do we want to rotate about. Again, my top WCS would be the correct one. If I wanted to, I'm gonna go ahead and just back plot or verify actually the front side here, just so we can kind of get a feel of what's going on. You can see I'll go through, I'll basically do my spot drill, my drill, and then I can do that dynamic milling with the filtering and maybe even a contour to finish. Again, by going into the simulator options and telling it to pull off that stock model, but also my tombstone and vices, we can now get proper collision checking for when we go to maybe a side feature and we can check against hitting one of my other vices or parts here. And then just to show you lastly here about the transform of the transform, I do have uh, some code here just to show you on each particular work offset. This is again using the Simcoe Edit Pro. One of the features in there is using these bookmarks. So quickly and easily you can bookmark and go to each particular uh, place you'd like. So in our case, I bookmark a couple of these work offsets. You can see G54 is highlighted. If I go to the next one, you can see G55, 56, 57, Right, and then we can actually get into a lot of the extended work offsets. You can see we're at a B270, 54.1, P14. Right, so I'm using a lot of those extended work offsets uh, in order to maintain that on my part. Yeah, so we had a, a good question here about why do we need to keep the WCS to top and not the front? And so the short answer with that is our rotation is gonna be based around the WCS, and that's gonna be going off of our world coordinate Z. Per toolpath, we're going to make the toolpath, or the T-plane and the C-plane, at the particular plane we actually wanna cut, such as the front view, or the front plane, the right side plane, things like that. You can see by my WCS to top and my T-plane up front, that's now gonna position the tool to that front plane and go from there. If my WCS was also set to front, it would be treated as in a three axis toolpath and it would not apply any rotation between the different planes. It would treat everything as if you're doing a new, brand new setup and you're actually gonna jog the machine and, and or, or tell the machine what rotation angles uh, you manually want to rotate to by keeping your WCS set to top and then working on your tool planes of anything rotating around, say, the front, the right, things like that. The post is actually able to output that correct rotational angle.
next question was, and this is common on horizontal machines, is how do you program a quill or a W axis? And that's typically a custom option we can add into the post. Um, you know, a lot of people do, you know, manually enter what they want their quill value to be. But if you want it to be programmable in Mastercam, you can email our tech department uh, the type of machine and the sample of the output. And then what we can do is typically add it into the miscellaneous values page. And then you could set what you want your W extension to be. So that was all of our pre-planned content. I do have one more poll I want to launch here. Ryan had for, you know, why do I have to keep the WCS top? And that really works, you know, with any fourth axis application in Mastercam. So even if you have a vertical mill with a fourth axis rotary, you want to leave the WCS as top and then your particular faces as the updated tool planes. And then, you know, the post will handle all those um, in, in that case in, in A axis rotation. So, uh, we got a few more questions filtering in here, so we'll we'll try to get to them. But like I said, that was the end of our pre-planned content. The recording's still going, and like I said, that'll be up later today. But let's see what else we got in here. Uh, we had a question: Is Mastercam and Verisurf compatible with a touchscreen computer and a stylus? Yes, I don't I don't see why it wouldn't be because a you know a touchscreen or a stylus is essentially imitating where your mouse cursor is. So I don't see why you wouldn't be able to do that. I haven't personally tested it, but certainly worth a shot. Uh, Kevin, your, your question about coolant commands, just email. You, you can email tech, T-E-C-H, at shoprank.com with that request, and we can update the M code coolant commands on your machine. That's, that's typically a pretty, pretty quick fix. And yes, the webinar will be available on YouTube. Since I still have my poll up, let me close that out and I can show you guys the easiest way to get there. So if you go to our website, and right in the top left corner here, we have all of our social media channels. So you can click on YouTube. And then it'll pull up, you know, it's youtube.com forward slash shopware inc. And that will have all of our previous videos on there. So all of our previous webinars, we'll, we'll do, you know, quick tech tip videos and, you know, really any other topics people, people want to cover. How would you handle WCS as top view then when you have multiple setups? Basically front facing up to a machine front and back, then stand it up for front, and then left, right, and back. So I see. So you're basically, you know, taking the part out of the vise and then flipping it for, you know, op, op two. Um, yeah, then, then, you would, then you would have to switch your WCS for where it's oriented um, from the, where the top of the machine is looking at it. So in that case, you would um, represent uh, your WCS as that new plane. Um, for this fourth, as, fourth axis, fourth axis uh, scenario that we were kind of going over today, that's when you're going to be leaving that top as, uh, as your WCS and then just changing your, uh, your uh, construction tool planes at that point. Yeah, so I think an easy way to think about that is if, if you have to physically move the part as an op or set up in the machine, that's when you want to update your, your WCS. If the machine is handling rotation or position of the part for you with either a horizontal or a rotary axis, that's when you want to leave it as top. So we're a couple minutes over our allotted time, but um, we'll keep answering questions if you guys want to hang around. What would be the best settings for best surface finish? That's a tough one, Rick, because there are so many variables in that scenario. You know, if I got a uh, $400,000 here on CNC, that's, you know, gold, gold plated, essentially, I want to probably leave the filter just off and it's going to handle it all for me. You know, maybe I could turn on the smoothing set settings and shift the points randomly. And kind of like where I was talking about before, you know, if I got a 20 year old Fidal with zero look ahead, a good place to start would be that 9010. So it's not going to filter a ton of code, but it is going to add arcs in there. 
And then if you see if the machine is still a little bit juddery, you can go to maybe 80-20 and then start playing with what your total tolerance is. So by default, the tolerance is one thou. And you know what I found, if you tighten that volume up, say you go to a tenth instead of a thou, it's essentially going to you know multiply by a factor the amount of code you're going to get. So, you know, depending on what the RA finish of the part and stuff needs to be, then you can start playing with those values. But if you're, say you're doing a roughing tool path, then what I do is say you're leaving 20 thou a stock on a Opti rough or a 2D dynamic rough tool path. So I have, I have 20 thou a material to play with before I'm violating the part. So what you could do is set your total tolerance to 10 thou. So the, the total room you're, you're giving the part to allow the tool path to adjust to insert arcs where needed is still half of what your stock to leave is. So you're, you're giving it then a factor in the other direction of it more room for the, for the software to insert arcs and shorten up the code. So if I were to take an example of, you know, like that 3D Opti rough that Joe was doing, if I were to set the total tolerance to 10 thou and say like that 3565 filtering settings towards the line arc side, then I'm really going to shorten up that program. You know, I'm from, from the default to those sort of settings, you're, you're going to see a 95% reduction in the length of the NC program versus what the default is. So you know, on the roughing side, like I was saying there, there's there's some kind of easy rules to follow to really just shorten up the code and get a program, you know, quickly out to the machine. Because the other thing to think about there is when I'm applying that math to shorten up the program, it's also going to shorten up the calculation time. And, you know, as a demo guy on the Mastercam side, you know, I have all my defaults set up that, that way. So I can calculate an Opti rough tool path super quick because I have my total tolerance set to 10 thou instead of a thou and I'm at you know typically like a 50 50 on my filtering setting so you know think of every line of G code is a calculation of math that the software has to do so the less lines of code there are the less math the software has to do so and yeah Dave that's a that's a good idea you can either um, split by machine group or toolpath group a, a quick setting I do in Mastercam is the default for toolpath groups is, I think it says toolpath group one, toolpath group two. I go into my files here and go to configuration. And on your toolpath manager page, I always switch my toolpath group to a user defined name and I just call it op. And then I start it with 10 and my increment value is 10. So if I want to do a, another toolpath group here, I'll right click and say new toolpath group, but I can't because I don't have anything in here. So let, let me do a toolpath real quick. Okay. Now I can say click on my top here, click on machine group first, and then say new toolpath group. And now I got op 20. So, you know, depending on how many setups the part has, you can then quickly organize by op um, where, where all those tool paths are. And what's nice too, you know, if you're doing similar types of tool paths around say six sides of a part, you can then just, you know, right click copy an op from one op to another, and then just update the planes and geometry and, and be on your way for that particular tool path. So hope that helps. Just reading another question here. I have a part in the shape of an L and I drill holes in the front plane and in the left plane. I need to cut a chamfer along the top of the part. If I pick up my contour in the front plane, will the tool path have the B rotations to continue the contour around the part? Yeah, you would, Carl, you would, that's, that's where something like either curve or um, the model chamfer tool path in multi-axis would, would help. So think of anything as like a standard contour or a chamfer, you know, that's a two or a three axis tool path. 
So you have to determine your, your planar rotation if you want to work around multiple sides of the part. Now, I mean, you know, if you want the tool to just basically dive in Z to accomplish that, that, that wouldn't really work because then the, the chamfer wouldn't be, uh, you know, tangent to the contour you're trying to cut. So that's, that's where you could do like a, like that new deeper tool path where you can basically window apart and say, break all edges and then it'll handle all those rotations for you. And, and that's another thing to think about too, because curve will accomplish the same sort of thing. That's not quite as automatic as deeper, but you, you can add what's called curve and drill five axis to even a base level mill. So the handy part about that is, is, especially on the drill side. So take that tombstone example Ryan had, you know, if you had, let's say 40 quarter inch holes all on different sides of the parts around the tombstone, I could just say, you know, I could control click based on diameter of the hole, apply drilling operations to wherever that hole exists on the entire tombstone. And then both the tool path and the post would handle all of those rotations for you. And so even if you have a, just a four axis machine, all of our standard horizontal posts will, will, will support full four axis code. So, and you know, even though the actual tool path in the drill scenario isn't gonna be a true four axis move, it's, it's still gonna handle all that rotation stuff for you. And you know, the curve and drill, I think ballpark is, you know, an under $2,000 option to add to a base level mill. So if you are getting into a lot of rotation drilling and programming, that money can make itself up in, you know, a couple of jobs. So if that's it, we appreciate you guys all again, you know, taking time out of your work, work day to attend and we'll have this up on YouTube shortly. So everybody have a good day and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks guys.